friends, maybe we'll try to launch uh, our apologies for um, the technical difficulties here. My name's Philip Barlow from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Studies, and we're delighted you could be with us here. We're thankful for uh, Dr. Janice Johnson, all her scholarship and work that's prepared her for uh, to share with us today, and also for her indulgence. If I were the speaker and the technology collapsed, I would mimic turning over tables in the temple or something um, <laughs> radical, so she's being gracious. Um, because we're without this microphone, we'll, how am I doing in the back there? Um, okay, so I think you'll be able to hear Janice, who has a better voice than I do, and we are recording um, today's session, and the microphone is working for the recording, so you could revisit that if um, any of this falls on your deaf ears or um, our mute voices. Uh, we'd like to um, call things to order because we clearly need prayers right now, so I've asked a special prayer, Dr. Christopher Blythe, um, who's visiting the Maxwell Institute this year to offer um, a prayer for us. Chris. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we get to gather together today and listen and learn about the research that Dr. Johnson has been diligently working on. We're grateful for thy guidance in her work, and we're grateful for the generosity that makes such studies possible. We ask for thy spirit to attend us, and we say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. I um, want to call your attention to another um, event that the Maxwell Institute is um, sponsoring. If you could make notes on your calendars, Friday, October 12th, which I guess is a week from this Friday, uh, from 9 a.m. to 3.15 p.m. in the Varsity Theater. Uh, the um, symposium will be commemorating the 1978 priesthood and temple revelation. We have a dynamite um, litany of speakers. Um, I think that'll be well worth your time. Friday, October 12th, starting at 9. Um, my friend Dr. Janice Johnson was um, educated around and about at our esteemed institution here in Provo and later at the Vanderbilt Divinity School. There's nothing like a good divinity school to give you a different angle of vision and also in Britain at the University of Leicester. Le <coughs> Leicester. 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 Um, thank you. That was Janice Johnson's revelatory voice coming to me right <laughs> um, then. Uh, Janice studies American religious history and particularly Mormon history and gender. Studying race and gender is such a common phrase out in the world when universities are looking in the humanities for a scholar that it can be a little numbing, but for those of you who aren't in the field of history or the humanities particularly to be familiar with that, somewhere a generation or so ago we um, discovered that the history we were writing was sophisticated and ever-learning, but we forgot half the human race. So we started paying attention to the other half. And that's not just a matter of, oh, women said this, or women said that, etc., but um, much of the stuff that we study, the topics, the flow of history, the theology, the philosophy, has gendered implications. Um, is often articulated historically by men and interpreted by men, and it looks different uh, once you're uh, conscious. So the entire field of history, let alone religious history or philosophy or linguistics, had a rug pulled, broom, and the whole field had to be changed. We're still exploring the implications of that, probably will be for the indefinite future, and Dr. Johnson contributes to that enterprise. Um, she's written about the religious experience of early women converts um, to the church. 
she's written about the Mountain Meadow Massacre and in particular the prosecution of the Mountain Meadow Massacre. She's published a book um, more widely available to Latter-day Saints, First-Hand Experiences and Testimonies of the Restoration and other things. But her current research, which is um, what she'll be talking about today, focuses on the Book of Mormon and how early Latter-day Saints um, processed it, engaged it. There's been a trope in um, the scholarship about the Book of Mormon, including my own writing, that has construed uh, that the Book of Mormon functioned particularly as a symbol um, a marker of the fact of the Restoration and that its content was less studied. And there's something to that thesis, at least in the, um, because we can document it, at least for the public use of the Book of Mormon vis-a-vis, -vis, say, the Bible in Joseph Smith and other church leaders. And yet, uh, Dr. Johnson's research is taking us um, somewhere new so that we can study more firsthand and she'll explain how, what her sources are, um, is really breaking new ground in helping us to understand what the Book of Mormon meant to converts and practitioners in the first generations uh, of the Restoration. Um, beyond all that, beyond her credentials and smarts and interesting topic, uh, Janice is a fabulous human being. I've come to know her in the last year as a colleague over at the Maxwell Institute. My own colleagues over there um, persecute me with a Mormon smile on their face about the tawdry nature of my office. They, in their good moods, they say Barlow's office is in transition and it wants a restoration. <laughs> I, they don't always say it out loud, but I see it in their eyes when I walk by at the Institute. Uh, to go into Dr. Johnson's office, however, is to enter sacred space. It looks like the object of pilgrims would go to find their way there. So um, that's a long-winded long way of saying she's a good human. Let's welcome Dr. Johnson. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Um, I am quite loud, so just let me know. Someone flag me down if I'm not being loud enough. Um, but I'm going to have to say next a little bit or put up my finger. So let's start with the next slide. Um, Leather-bound copies of the first edition of the 586-page Book of Mormon were published and sold beginning 26 March 1830. Before there was a prophet, there was a translator, legally the author and the proprietor of the book. The title page told of plates written by the spirit of prophecy and revelation from which the book originated. Before the publication was complete, Joseph Smith encouraged Oliver Cowdery that a great call for our books had already commenced. The book emerged before there was any church to join. The rest would come later. Initially, individuals decided how they would respond to this golden Bible. Was it counterfeit or divine? Was it the greatest piece of superstition or a revelation from God? What would it be to them? Now, not long after its publication, Samuel Smith, the brother of Joseph Smith and the first missionary called, introduced the Book of Mormon to Methodist lay preacher Phineas Young. Um, this manner in which he's introducing the book, I think, might look familiar to you because he is quoting Moroni 10. Um, he's laying out that same sort of pattern that I used, that I laid out for people as a missionary. And he is doing that. If you will read this book with a prayerful heart and ask God to give you a witness, you will know of the truth of this work. Um, and Phineas Young says that he will do so. He decided to investigate the book, um, but initially his idea is to make himself acquainted with the errors. Um, to his surprise, he felt a conviction that the book was true. For more than a year, he preached from the book to Methodist congregations until he decided that he could not unite the Book of Mormon with Methodism. He resolved that he must leave one and cleave to the other. His reliance on the new book had developed to the point that he chose the book 
over Methodism. Now, newspaper publisher William Phelps similarly dated his conversion to 9 April 1830, when he first obtained a copy of the Book of Mormon. From that point on, his heart was there, though he hadn't yet met Joseph Smith, nor had he been baptized. Conviction of Smith's prophetic call and a decision to convert would come later for Phelps. His affinity with the book was primary. Now, when elders shared the Book of Mormon with Sarah G. Armin P. and her family, oh, I'm sorry, go back. Um, in the summer of 1835, Sarah was anxious to see the book for herself. Rather than spending the evening with visitors, Sarah asked to be excused so she could read. She spent most of the night reading the book and was greatly astonished at its contents. She detailed, it left an impression on my mind not to be forgotten, for in fact the book appeared to be open before my eyes for weeks. At the outset, Sarah had no expectation of joining a new church, but her connection to the book blossomed. She became a Latter-day Saint as a result of that relationship. The book unfolded the possibility of individual numinous experience not to be discarded once they accepted Smith as a prophet. Moreover, a relationship with God was not just the prerogative of prophets. Smith's egalitarian impulse offered each convert the possibility of experiencing the divine. In 1841, Wilfred Woodruff recorded a meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in Nauvoo, where Joseph Smith proclaimed the Book of Mormon the most correct of any book, capable of bringing one nearer to God than any book. The introduction of each Book of Mormon published by the LDS Church since 1981 has included that oft-repeated assertion, while, la while lacking a sometimes assumed nod to perfection, this bold claim is about practice, about lived application. Belief that the heavens were open and God called a modern prophet began to collapse the chasm between humanity and divinity. Smith promised the readers of the book that its content could narrow that space even further. The text was of central import. Now, the Quran labels pe uh, different religious groups as, a pe as people of the book for their reliance on a text. And from the time of the Puritans, Protestants in the New World have been commonly known as a people of the book. Their book was the Bible. Before any of these soon-to-be Latter-day Saints heard of Joseph Smith or his gold Bible, they were already a people of the book. Though the Bible continued as a locus of authority, we need to better understand how the Book of Mormon became scripture for early converts. Religious pluralism changes how we think about and define scripture. Without an established church declaring scripture by decree, adherents determine what is scripture to them. And with expanding 19th century religious pluralism under disestablishment, Americans had increasingly imaginative and expansive responses defining what constituted scripture. A relationship with a text defined scripture. Individuals chose what mattered to them what had the potential of offering a connection to the divine. As individuals build a relationship with a new text, the text transforms into scripture. The connection imbues the text with transformative power. Um, the relationship formed between a people and the text comes through action, personal practice. Practice Yet lived religion or practice is an unwieldy category, and source material is likewise cumbersome. At times, these untamed sources are difficult to locate long before analysis begins. Though Latter-day Saint history boasts a remarkable trove of personal writings, some are more useful than others. <laughs> Many never sat down to write about their experience with the Book of Mormon until decades later, and memory will always be shaped over time. Very few references to the Book of Mormon text include quotation marks and direct citations. Our job would be a lot easier um, if, if they, they liked quotation marks and direct citations. Though close reading of personal writings provides evidence of a direct connection to the book's text. Despite the difficulty, personal writings offer a window into the daily lives and practice of individual saints, not accessible in any other way. Personal writings and the books themselves reveal how some early converts began to develop a relationship with the text, how they transitioned from a people of the book to a people of the books. Now, 
to talk about the sign of the book. Some Latter-day Saints detail individual otherworldly experiences with the physical Book of Mormon prior to reading its pages. Ezra Thayer was filled with wrath when he initially heard of the Gold Bible in the fall of 1830. This changed when he first handled a copy of the book given to him by Hiram Smith at the Smith family's Manchester, New York home. Ezra wrote of this moment. I said, let me see it. I then opened the book and I received a shock with such exquisite joy that no pen can write and no tongue can express. He bought the book for 14 shillings and when he opened it again, he said he felt a double portion of the spirit. He was truly in heaven. As a 14-year-old girl living in Waterton, New York in 1835, Zina Huntington came home from school when she saw the Book of Mormon, that strange new book lying on the windowsill of our sitting room. She later, she said, later said as she picked it up, the sweet influence of the Holy Spirit accompanied it to such an extent that I pressed it to my bosom in a rapture of delight, murmuring as I did so, this is truth, truth, truth. Upon encountering the Book of Mormon for the first time, some early converts, like Thayer and Huntington, heard of its miraculous origins, listened, and they believed it was divinely appointed because of their own transcendent talismanic experience. They didn't need to read the whole book. Holding it was enough. Their experience with the book led them to immediately identify the book as something important that would lead them to truth. Now, similarly, early LDS periodicals most often focused on the book as a signal or an ensign that marked Smith's prophetic call, the opening of the heavens, and preparation for the impending eschaton. From the mid-20th century, a handful of academic articles and books have slowly developed an understanding of the Book of Mormon as a sign. When combined with the limited extant record of Smith's preaching from the Book of Mormon, and the limited attention given to the Book of Mormon in early church periodicals, these experiences lend support to the contention of some scholars that the early Latter-day Saints did not extensively use the new scripture. What it signaled or enacted was most important. These scholars argue that the sign was of primary importance and the Bible was the main theological source in early Mormon history. Now, considering the function of the Book of Mormon as a sign is a significant element of Book of Mormon reception history. Nevertheless, it is insufficient to fully understand the range of the relationship between early converts and the book. Moreover, at times the argument has been expanded and inflated to claim that early saints did not readily incorporate the new scripture into their devotions. When combined with a focus on the sign of the book, such assessments make a theological argument about the content of the book and a lack of significance for the early saints. My work provides a corrective to such elaborations. Expanding our source material extends our vision of early converts and their relationship with the book. Now, in the last decade, a number of scholars have focused on the influence of the Book of Mormon on early Latter-day Saint practice and have begun to develop a greater understanding of Book of Mormon use. These sources point to the book as a wellspring for early Latter-day Saint ecclesiology, liturgy, and missiology. While I will not take time to identify and evaluate those arguments today, their collective emphasis on the role played by the content of the Book of Mormon leads us to consider the limitations inherent within a, the book as sign argument. Beyond that, as of yet, none of these approaches addresses the personal role of the Book of Mormon in the daily lives and practice of early Latter-day Saints. Now, Roman Catholics first introduced the Bible on the American continent, but ubiquitous Protestant Biblicism soon eclipsed that history. For many Protestants, reliance on the biblical text was absolute. They were clearly a people of the book. The Bible centered their lives. After a local minister focused on revival and resurgence of faith, 18th century evangelical Sarah Osborne narrated her conversion with words from the biblical text, the book of James. The words turned her away from a battle with her parents and desperate thoughts of suicide and turned her to God. Osborne's prolific writings bleed the biblical text. Hardly a sentence passes in her writing without some biblical phrase, allusion, or reference. She is part of a larger tradition. For centuries, British subjects and then New Americans personally relied on the biblical text. Its narrative and lexicon shaped their lives. Now, Americans continued to write personal inscriptions in their Bibles and see themselves in its narrative into the 19th century. 
Like Sarah Osborne a century earlier, biblical language pervaded how many Americans wrote and shaped how, and it shaped how they understood their lives. Um, Phil um, has demonstrated the dominant nature of the biblical text in the 19th century. Um, he compares the, ex uh, the experience of Charles Finney, uh, the prominent Second Great Awakening revivalist, and the mother of, jo of Joseph Smith, Lucy Mack Smith. Um, Finney heard words he recognized as scripture for the first time during his conversion. Um, as Lucy recounted about with a dire illness, she paraphrased scripture as she pled with God. The King James text narrated their lives. It was their mother tongue. Now, like most Americans, those who would become Latter-day Saints were steeped in biblical grammar, as were Osborne and Smith and Finney. They were first to people of the book. They demonstrated high levels of biblical literacy before they ever heard of Joseph Smith's gold Bible. As Reformed Baptist, Elizabeth and Newell Whitney sought biblical truth. Elizabeth wrote that one night the spirit rested upon us and a cloud overshadowed the house. Like the children of Israel or those gathered at the baptism of Jesus, the cloud offered them a visible sign of divine presence. A celestial messenger spoke to them from the cloud and told them to prepare to receive the word of the Lord, for it was coming. The biblical narrative provided the symbols that guided the interpretation of their experience and ultimately led them to follow Joseph Smith. Um, for a recent Latter-day Saint convert in a chaotic 1837 Kirtland, um, can we go on to the next? Thanks. Um, the biblical text similarly provided a parallel to her own present situation. For Mary Fielding, the circumstances of Korah and his company when they rose up against Moses and Aaron in number 16 exactly described the predicament of the saints. She seriously pondered whether the Lord would come out in a similar way or not. She could not tell. Um, for those of us not so wholly submersed in the biblical text, in number 16, the earth opens up and swallows all the apostates. Um, these early Latter-day Saints likened the scriptural text to their lives before a Book of Mormon prophet ever pled with them to do so. Um, for descendants of a Reformation standard of sola scriptura, adding more books was a significant choice. However, in the post-revolutionary period, many Americans did just that. Um, Latter -days, early Latter-day Saints were not alone in what Lori Mayfley Kipp has called devotional creativity with the biblical text. This was not necessarily revolutionary itself. Complete sovereignty over the word escaped them, even within the Protestant agreement of Sola Scriptura. Different translations, designs, formats, and interpretations unleashed a cacophony of understanding and ultimately promoted pluralism. In the 19th century, this resulted in a variety of different writings that could be classified as American scripture. Now, rather than writing a biblical commentary or a direct emendation of the biblical text, in a striking prophetic act, Joseph Smith produced a whole book. Latter-day Saints, like many other Americans, would not leave behind their Bibles in favor of the new book. Their Bibles led them to expand their view. So while the ca cadences of the King James echoed throughout the land, how did they move to accept a new book? Um, this process proceeded differently for all. Some had tra a transcendent experience with the book before reading a word. Yet for many, an initial experience was not enough. Further study had to support a preliminary positive response. Initial impressions could potentially deceive. Um, Steve Harper has done some great work on this, that many of the early... Latter-day Saint converts were really paranoid about being deceived. They were really worried about this. Um, a charismatic leader was not a divine guarantee. For that, they relied on their Bibles and on the Spirit. Acceptance of this new book could take place in hours, in days, or over years. There was no singular formula or timeline, but for myriad early converts, significant reading of the new text, along with their Bibles, began to develop a relationship with the book and led to conversion. This was consistent enough to become a significant trope as Latter-day Saints later crafted their conversion narratives. Now, as John Murdoch, now we catch up to John Murdoch, um, began to, to learn of the Book of Mormon in the fall of 1830, he felt an impulse to immediately know of its truth. After obtaining a copy of the book, he declined to observe a confirmation meeting, choosing rather to immediately delve into the book. 
His conversion narrative reveals urgency. This night must prove it, true or false. Reading the Book of Mormon confirmed truth to him. He was ready to unite with the Church of Christ the next day. After his baptism, he shared the new book as he read with his friends and family. As a missionary, he preached of the book and encouraged others to read for themselves. The content was a critical part of personal evaluation of the book, both for his conversion as well as for his subsequent missionary service, and it provided a significant pattern for his future life. Um, this is actually, John Murdoch labels his autobiography, which has significant sections from his, just taken from his journal, as he labels it an abridged, as an abridged record. Um, as you get into his autobiography, he, he feels a kinship with Mormon. And he, he thinks he's like Mormon. He wants to be like Mormon. Um, when he finishes his, um, his history, and he dies, his son picks up his record and mimics Book of Mormon language, saying that he now picks up his, his father's record. Um, let's go to the next slide. That same fall, Reformed Baptist Parley Pratt noted that he felt a strange interest in the book before he read it. Suddenly reading eclipsed all other needs. He described his continued study in words now familiar to many Latter-day Saints. After this, I commenced its course, but it contents by course. I read all day. Eating was a burden. I had no desire for food. Sleep was a burden when the night came, for I preferred reading to sleep. Pratt continued to demonstrate his obsession with the content of the book. Its discovery greatly enlarged my heart and filled my soul with joy and gladness. I esteemed the book or the information contained in it more than all the riches of the world. The content of the book led his initiation into the Church of Christ and immediate exertions as a new member. Now, Pratt was not the only one for whom the book propelled sleepless nights. Um, for others, initial positive responses motivated serious and lengthy study before action. Caroline Barnes met an elderly um, gentleman from Vermont who taught her of the Book of Mormon shortly after moving to Kirtland. Ohio in 1834. Though she was soon convinced of the truth, she considered it best to read the Book of Mormon and search the scriptures until she was thoroughly convinced that it was the work of the Lord. After studying the Bible and the Book of Mormon for several months, she was baptized. Converts like Barnes and Pratt did not leave the book after their initial interest was satiated. It compelled continued work to build their relationship with the book. Now, accepting new book as scripture for oneself was the first step, step towards conversion, yet few kept their conviction, conviction to themselves. Um, another Book of Mormon pattern, <laughs> definitely. Missionary work would become a hallmark of the fledgling church, but an official call to proselytize was not essential. Finding value in the Book of Mormon led many to ask their familiars to consider the content of the book themselves. Um, after hearing of a golden book, the first galley sheet of 16 Book of Mormon pages encouraged Thomas Marsh to learn more. He immediately gave it to his wife, Elizabeth, who also read and believed it to be the work of God. Um, his sister, they shared it with his sister, Anne Marsh Abbott, and her husband, Lewis, and they also believed. Anne, in turn, pled that their oldest brother, Nathan, would read the Book of Mormon without prejudice so he could know the plan of salvation for himself. And Thomas continued to invite others to consider the book. On a trip to Providence, Rhode Island, he met Mary Ann Angel and shared a Book of Mormon with her. She believed, and she would share her book with, with others. Um, there's this family tradition that she would only lend out the book for 72 hours. She wanted to give people enough time to read, but not too much time for her to be away from it. Now, Lucy Max Smith likewise desired to share the Book of Mormon with her brother and sister-in-law. She wrote an 1831 letter focused primarily on sharing the content of the new book, this revelation that is called the Book of Mormon. She summarized the narrative of the first two books, then she then moved on to the coming forth of the record, interestingly somewhat minimizing Joseph's role in the process. She pled, entreating you as one that feels for your souls to seek an interest in Christ, and when you have an opportunity to receive this work, 
Do not reject it, but read it and examine for yourselves. Reading the book, as Lucy had, was central to receiving a personal witness of the restoration. And those who believed desired that others might likewise know for themselves. If the content of the Book of Mormon and Restoration um, Scripture played a significant role in one, uh, one's own conversion, Latter-day Saints worked to share that possibility with others. Now, the Latter-day Saints' most common contemporary epithet reflects a relationship to the book, even though we're trying to remove that, I guess, today. Um, today, many Latter-day Saints are more conversant with their Books of Mormon than with their Bibles. Um, understanding how the Book of Mormon became scripture for this first generation of converts means uncovering scraps of evidence that establish their relationship to the book. Barring the presence of specific scripture journals or extensive sermon notes, and if you have any of those, I want them because they're pretty hard to come by. Um, establishing an understanding of textual pra practice is naughty, yet close and careful attention yields much. Now, Though there was not a consistent formal structure of worship in Kirtland, Latter-day Saints established the practice of reading from the Book of Mormon in the temple during weekly worship meetings. Wilford Woodruff's Kirtland diary yields brief insight into public devotional Book of Mormon use. In 1837, Woodruff recorded David Whitmer warning the 70s that they were in days of prosperity, yet all was not well. Without great repentance, immediately their pride and many sins would lead them to destruction as pride led the ancient, ancient Nephites. On another occasion, Patriarch Joseph Smith Sr. asked Woodruff to share a devotional with his fellow saints on their fast day. He read all of what is now Jacob 5, the longest chapter in the current Book of Mormon. Um, length was clearly not a hindrance to reading. He then offered his interpretation. Reading wasn't enough. Now, Woodruff's journal um, surpasses in its um, scope, surpasses just about every, every other Mormon journal during this, this early period. And he only tells us for the content of four sermons in the temple during his whole time in Kirtland. But three out of the four come from the Book of Mormon. Um, Woodruff does not single these sermons out as extraordinary. The book had just become part of their devotions. Now, even concise nods to practice um, help us develop a better understanding. 23-year-old Mary Haskin Parker Richards recorded this journal entry. December 1846, Sunday the 27th, came home, read a while in the Book of Mormon, helped mother get dinner, after which Elsie Snyder came to go to singing school with me. Um, though certainly not an effusive account offering detailed exegesis, Mary's nonchalant mention of her reading in the Book of Mormon before helping her mother yields insight into the normalcy of the moment. This was not something extraordinary. It was the ordinary course of things. Now, the material record of 19th century Books of Mormon also reveals way in which the books were used, how people developed a relationship with the book. Um, here we have title pages from the first three um, editions of the Book of Mormon. We're going to go through a number of slides pretty quickly here. Um, but we have um, members who personalize their books. Um, we have um, people identifying their books. Um, also, we have a number of books that have been passed down in families. And we can see this one, Joseph Holbrook. This is Joseph Holbrook's first edition, Book of Mormon. And it was passed down. And you have the names of the different people who had it until Spencer W. Kimball received it. Um, and then he gave it to the Church History Library in, in 1985. Um, as the 19th century progressed, many kept track of the book's narrative in the margins. As we move along in the 19th century, people tend to begin to write more in their books. Um, we have less, uh, perhaps, the possibility that they're going to have more than just one book. Um, here we have dedications. We have another, this, this book was the mission president of the French, French mission. Um, nope, not the French mission, Hazel, remind me. What was he president of? Netherlands. He was from the Netherlands mission and he was president of the Belgium district conference. Um, and this book pass, was passed around and every, it seems that we think that they were missionaries um, who had it actually inscribed it. Um, and, and kept this, this memento. Um, let's go to the next slide.
slide. We have people, so the first, um, we don't have a table of contents in the first edition of the Book of Mormon. So we have someone here who's created their own table of contents. Um, we have a lot of books that people will write page numbers on the fly leaves at the front or the back of the book, things that they want to remember. Um, let's go to the next one. Here we have a number of people who create their own indexes. Um, the first published index for the Book of Mormon is published in 1835, so five years after the first edition. Um, some people actually get those indexes sewn into their books, but we have a number of people who have kind of haphazardly created their own. Let's go to the next slide. These are two that are a little more planned out. Um, the one on the right was clearly crafted beforehand. It's all alphabetized. Um, the one on the left started out alphabetized, and then he seems to have continued it over years um, as he studies and learns um, of the text. He's also, if you can see these signs at the end of an entry, so this one that says the three witnesses, sign, and I don't know if that's an 11 or just a mark, but throughout his Book of Mormon, he has these little signs, these symbols. So he has marked, so he can turn to a page, and then he can look up in his own index what, what is there. Let's go to the next one. Um, this Book of Mormon I particularly liked. In this image here, you can see... This person, this um, man, has he's glued in this page to the back of his book. And I was kind of puzzled as to what this was initially. But his process of deciding whether or not the Book of Mormon was scripture was that he compared the Book of Mormon with E.D. Howe's Mormonism Unveiled, which is the first anti-Mormon book, which is published in 1834. And this is his analysis and he glues it into the back of the book because he wants to keep it for safekeeping. Okay, let's go to the next. Now, once an individual created a bond with the book, it could continue to develop. Orson Pratt learned of the book from his older brother Parley when he was 19 and living in upstate New York. Years later, he described his own consistent reading of the Book of Mormon. I had for two years during my first acquaintance with the book read it so much that I could repeat over chapter after chapter, page after page of many portions, and could do it just as well with the book closed or laid to one side. Now, Pratt clearly wants to demonstrate the centrality of the book in his life. Certainly not all possessed Pratt's capacity for memorization, or I might add hyperbole. Um, they might actually have to bring their book with them. Um, let's go to the next one. This, in the Book of Mormon was rendered more portable with the second pocket size edition in 1837. Um, in response to pressing calls for more books and the vast importance attached to their contents, the editors, Parley Pratt and John Goodsell, decided on a condensed form so as to render greater convenience to elders and others who convey the same to different parts. Improved accessibility to the second edition encouraged and facilitated more use with greater ease. Now, in 1839, portability was useful when Laura Clark Phelps shared a Book of Mormon with the Richards family in Columbia, Missouri. Um, this is not an actual picture of Laura. This is just how I imagine her. Um, or, or maybe like Wonder Woman on a horse. Um, but however, um, this was not exceptional. Sharing the Book of Mormon was a consistent practice. However, Phelps did not go to Columbia as a missionary. Um, she was on a mission to help her husband escape from prison. Um, her husband, Morris, was imprisoned in the Boone County Jail in Columbia, Missouri, along with King Follett and Parley Pratt. They had languished there for almost nine months when Laura and Parley both dreamt of an escape. Now, this story, this is from one edition of Parley's autobiography. Um, the story is often told and rarely shows Laura in the story, and she's critical here. Um, but um, Orson uh, Parley is one of those who is creating, um, who is writing and publishing in these early LDS newspapers. And he's one who's shaping how others are going to read about the Book of Mormon. But just reading what... Um, what Parley writes in the Millennial Star does not give us a full scope of his relationship with the book. 
Um, his brother Orson, likewise, um, as Orson is extremely prolific. But Orson, so Laura is there, Parley is there, they've had the same dream, and Orson shows up. Um, he comes to visit the jail, and he has a firm impression that they were about to be delivered. So they talked of their shared visions. Orson opened up the book of Mormon to a random page. Um, let's go to the next slide. Parley described the event. The first sentence that caught his eyes were the words of Ammon to King Lamoni. Behold, my brother and my brother, my brother and my brother and her in pr prison in the land of Madonai, and I go to deliver them. This is Alma 20. This was indeed a similar instance to ours. Ammon on that occasion had an own brother in prison and also brethren in the ministry and did deliver them. Our case was exactly similar, not in Madonai, but in Missouri. And what was still more strange, in a book of 600 pages, this was the only sentence that would have fitted our case. Um, from the second entry in the Virgilian Lots, individuals of learning would arbitrarily open a work of Virgil and use the text found on the page to predict the future. The book became a talisman capable of prophesying the future, a textual casting of lots. Though some religionists and church councils disputed this practice, there are believers who have practiced bibliomancy with the biblical text since they had access to their own Bibles. John Wesley viewed this as an appropriate and useful use of scripture when reason fails. In times of peril, many a believer has turned to a text imbued with divine power. Orson haphazardly opened the book and divined a prophetic parallel to their current circumstances. Often this practice will diverse, uh, divorce the text from its context, and Orson does ignore a portion of the context. It didn't matter to him that prisoners were jailed for their actions during the Mormon-Missouri War rather than proselytizing as missionaries. Um, a Book of Mormon missionary in jail with a promise of deliverance was more than specific enough. For these believers in the power of the book, they understood not only the specific words, but the context of the book as perfectly aligned with their own current context. They found comfort in the prophetic answer received. Now, implementing the shared dream on the 4th of July, the plotters even further highlighted their focus on the Book of Mormon story. They hoisted a flag made from a torn white shirt with red stripes, an eagle, and the word liberty. Like Alma's Captain Moroni, they lifted their own title of liberty. Though the townspeople mocked the Latter-day Saint prisoners' apparent 4th of July celebration from jail, <laughs> Um, the banner illustrated their belief that they would be successful as the book seemed to portend. Um, the prisoners initially escaped successfully. King Follett gets caught, but then they just let him go. Um, but the plan had not included what would happen to Laura, who was left with a feisty group of Missourians in the moment they learned of the prisoners' escape. As the crowd became unruly and abusive, a young boy came to her rescue. His family sheltered and cared for her for the next two weeks. She preached Mormonism to them, sang hymn, hymns with them, and gave them a hymnal as well as the Book of Mormon. The book had first captivated Laura Phelps in 1831, and she was baptized after several weeks of reading the book. Through those eight years, Laura's devotion to the book flourished. She offered the family of Missourians who provided her shelter and protection that which she valued, a Book of Mormon. The book permeates this tale of prison escape. These Latter-day Saints had already developed a relationship with the book. It was scripture to them not to be discarded in calamity. Alongside the Bible, the Book of Mormon became a divine conduit of peace and confidence in a time of crisis. Now, before early converts ever heard of Joseph and his gold Bible, they read their Bibles and saw its applicability to their lives. Their lives became holy as echoes and allusions of the King James text shaped their own narratives. Historian David Hall calls this practice patchwork quoting. Um, Bible readers would incorporate language, phrases, and allusions to the biblical text in their own writings. Very quickly, some early saints placed their new book alongside their Bibles and began to read the Book of Mormon in the same manner they had read the Bible. Though mastery of another 588 pages of scripture might take considerable time, for some engagement with the narrative happened post-haste. Their growing bond to the book to the text of the book demonstrated its earned place as scripture, and the new scripture also began to narrate these saints' lives in their own holy present. 
At times, personal writings divulge reading practices. Some use the book's text as a narrative through which to construct their own present, as did the prisoners in Columbia. Yet the depth of Book of Mormon usage is illustrated most thoroughly through intertextuality. Pervasive echoes, allusions, and expansions on the Book of Mormon text that appear in the early converts' writings. Smith's new scriptural editions were awash with biblical themes and passages. As the New Testament often echoes or alludes to the Hebrew Bible in both obvious and intricate ways, the Book of Mormon, as well as the New Revelations and the Doctrine and Co Covenants, also, indi um, also indicate a complex connection to the biblical text. In an extension of that biblical pattern, the writings of many early Latter-day Saints are littered with the Book of Mormon text through echoes, allusions, and expansions. Now they had two books that could shape their lives. Of course, to identify source material with surety, in this instance, the allusions must be unique to the Book of Mormon text through specific words and phrases. Um, in this instance, shared biblical language will not serve. Um, in late 1829, as Oliver Cowdery worked to complete the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon and oversee the book's publication in Palmyra, he incorporated echoes of the book's text as he updated Joseph on their progress. In his 6th November letter, he waxes personal, considering his position before God and the goodness of Christ, desiring nothing but to be an instrument in his hands, a Book of Mormon phrase. In his strident declaration of his reliance on Christ, he weaves the book's distinct text, narrating his own continuing conversion. Conditions of repentance, the great and last sacrifice, infinite atonement, endless torment, and eternal father of heaven and earth are all specific Book of Mormon language. Cowdery seamlessly incorporates the book's text as he recounts his own spiritual journey before the words have all been printed on the page. The book wasn't yet official scripture to anyone, but it spoke to Cowdery personally and illuminated his relationship with God. It was already scripture to him. Um, another significant example of elusive practices, Lucy Mack Smith's aforementioned letter to her brother and sister-in-law extensively describes the narrative of First and Second Nephi. Um, her precise summary of the book is notable, yet even more so is the intertextuality. Levina Fielding Anderson referred to the prevalence of biblical language in the oral practices of the Smith family. The King James was clearly their mother tongue. But what's more, Lucy's letter also abounds in Book of Mormon phraseology. The letter was written in January of 1831, just nine months after the book's publication. Upwards of 49% of the letter is made up of unique Book of Mormon language. Let's go to the next slide. I've actually highlighted all the specific Book of Mormon language here. Though many of her allusions originate in the first three books of the Book of Mormon, she echoes almost every book, excepting Enos, Jared, and Mormon, as well as her son's new revelations. She incorporated the language of new scripture into her own lexicon as she endeavored to witness her faith to her extended family. Now, her scripturalism is striking here, but moreover, this is not a singular instance. Lucy's son, Joseph Smith, channeled Nephi as he began to write his history for the first time in 1832. He was born of goodly parents. Other Latter-day Saints began their own personal writings in the same manner. Conceivably, the most single most read Latter-day Saint woman's writing, Lucy's history of her son, also mimics the same elusive practice. Though the cue of goodly parents is missing from her account, perhaps the result of an absentee father, she likewise begins with a Book of Mormon pattern. Having attained my 69th year and being afflicted with a complication of diseases and infirmities, um, this is the very beginning of Nephi, I give my last testimony to a world from whence I must soon take my departure. Mirroring words and content, she amalgamates the beginning of Nephi's record with Le Lehi's final teachings to his children. Like Nephi, she's evaluated her life, and like Lehi, she wants to share things of importance before she takes her departure. Whereas Smith may have carefully crafted the earlier letter to her brother, she dictates her history beginning in 1846. The oral transmission highlights the expansion of her mother and tongue to include new scripture. Smith not only directively and pervasively alludes to the Book of Mormon text, 
She also organizes um, the structure of her record after the book. Channeling Nephi, she details divisions within her writing. She denotes both a spiritual and a temporal record. As Smith incorporated the Book of Mormon text into her own record, she sacralized the Smith family history and tacitly acknowledged the earned place of the Book of Mormon as scripture. She becomes a new prophetic narrator, narrator engraving her own book of sacred history. Now she signs off, we got here a little early, <laughs> but she signs off the original draft of her record with a composite of the concluding words of Nephi, Mormon, and Moroni, in addition to other echoes and allusions from the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the New Revelations. It's difficult to quantify the intense scripturalism of her account, um, but I've given you a few of the, the references here to where she, where she is getting this from, and she melds it all together. Oh, thank you. Um, echoes and allusions to the Book of Mormon text ascribe value to the content and power of the book, to Lucy Smith. The words have become her own. The book has become her own. Now, other individuals also encounter narrative parallels to their lives in the Book of Mormon text, and in this manner expand on the original text. As Solomon Chamberlain chronicled his search for divine mercy, he detailed, I cried unto the Lord night and day for forgiveness of my sins, like Enos of old, till at length the Lord said, Solomon, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go in peace and sin no more. Though he is illustrating an experience prior to reading the Book of Mormon, and Enos is included, and in Enos is included in biblical genealogies, here Chamberlain specifically alludes to Enos in the Book of Mormon, who cried unto God all day long into the night when a voice said, Enos, thy sins are forgiven thee. Chamberlain fuses the book's text with prevalent biblical phrases to narrate his own sacred experience and simultaneously substantiates his immersion in the new book. Um, in her autobiographical sketch, Drusilla Hendricks gauged the role of scripture in her life during the Missouri period. We read considerable, mainly the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the Doctrine and Covenants. Moreover, she provides evidence of her personal interpretive practice. She commented, I often made myself feel like the old Nephite women while they were traveling in the wilderness, for they became strong like unto the men. Um, Drusilla's husband was, was shot, was injured at the Battle of Crooked River, and was paralyzed for the rest of his life. So that was a very um, significant burden. But she'd been reading First Nephi, and she saw a parallel in her life. The book offered the promise of God interceding into our life as God intervened on behalf of ancient saints. Now, Methodist Brigham Young began to read the Book of Mormon in 1830. In contrast to members of his family who accepted the book as revelation quickly, Young read for two years before choosing baptism. Young's most recent biographer, John Turner, maintains that though it took time, by the 1840s, Young was more comfortable with citing both the Bible and the Book of Mormon in his preaching. His 1840s British missionary letters to his wife, Marianne, illustrate this transition, as they include echoes and allusions to the book's text. At one point, he relates, I never have witnessed the hand of the Lord so visible in all my life as I have since I left home this time. My heart is like the charity of Aminadab. Now, though we've got an Aminadab referenced in both synoptic genealogies of Jesus, we don't know anything about that Aminadab. And in one obscure chapter in the Book of Mormon, we have a repentant Aminadab who became a great missionary among the Lamanites as he's testified to the miraculous work and love of God. Despite its obscurity, Young saw a missionary example in the text to which he likened his own experience. And he expected that Marianne got the reference. This is like quoting a movie. <laughs> she, he expected that she knew who Amenadab was. Once regarded as scripture, the narrative of the book could reach into their lives and create a new holy narrative. Now, in another extension of elusive practices and extending a common practice of biblical nomenclature, some of the earliest converts wanted their children to pattern lives after the Book of Mormon characters. While a common historical practice for parents to name their children from the Bible, naming children after past prophets is also a frequent practice in the Book of Mormon itself. 
While some name duplication within the book's text are familial, other name duplications suggest a desire that the child live a life of faith following the one for whom they are named. For some 19th century converts, conversion meant alienation or separation from biological families. Naming children after those in the Book of Mormon further established new familial construction bounded by spiritual loyalties. Naming could likewise strengthen current familial bonds with shared spiritual commitments. Um, Tama Durfee Minor believed the first time she heard a missionary preach in 1831 that the Book of Mormon was true. In 1835, she named her second son Moroni. Joseph blessed the child that he should be as great as Moroni of old. Um, so let's let's go to the next one more. Okay, and then every time I t- say a name, let's click <laughs> for a minute. Um, so Joseph blessed the child that he should be great as Moroni of old, and the people would flee unto him and call him blessed. Smith extended the role of patriarch through new scripture. Shortly after, thereafter, Miner's mother, Magdalena Durfee, intersected fertility spans and naming patterns um, when she too gave a birth to a son and named him Nephi. Um, Minor furthered the practice and called her next two sons, Mormon and Alma. Now, Alma is a pretty common 19th century um, name in England, but it's a woman's name. And um, it's, this is uh, the, the instance that I've seen of male children named Alma are, are Mormon. <laughs> um, beginning during the Kirtland period, this practice would expand over time. Nancy Alexander Tracy unequivocally explained her rationale as she named her second son. She said, we wanted him to have a big name out of the Book of Mormon, so we called him Laconius Moroni. (laughs) After two great men, he was a beautiful child. Um, She clearly had read the last third of the Book of Mormon. Um, She also named her third son Moses Mosiah, unifying the stick of Judah with the stick of Joseph and individually fulfilling biblical prophecy. Um, Before joining with the Church of Christ, she had named her first son Eli, Samuel's mentor in the temple, and the name of her oldest brother. But with her conversion, she suddenly had more books from which to find inspirational examples for her children that they might live out their own lives in sacred time. Now, both Isaac Morley and Lyman White named sons after the converted Lamanite King Lamoni. Um, And then in Kirtland, we have children named after Lehi Ammon, Alma, Moroni, Mosiah, and Nephi. Um, Parley Pratt, after 1844, names all of his sons after the Book of Mormon. Um, Thirteen sons and one daughter, a Native American daughter that is adopted, and they call her Abish. The 1850 United States census, Census records 63 Nephites who could live out their own holy narrative. Naming practices demonstrate familiarity with the text, as well as the extent to which the Book of Mormon narrative had become part of their lives. Elusive practices, including naming conventions, played a significant role in the developing interactions of many saints to the Book of Mormon text. They imbued it with power to shape their lives. Now, Elizabeth Terry Hayward chose baptism as a Latter-day Saint in 1838 and lived through some turbulent personal years before she gathered with the saints in Nauvoo. In early 1843, she recorded a poignant experience with the Book of Mormon. She noted, My mind had been somewhat somewhat down for some time, and on the 25th of January, I was reading in the Book of Mormon, where it says, Thy watchmen shall lift up their voices, and with the voice together they shall sing, for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord shall bring again Zion. Break forth into joy, sing together ye waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord hath comforted his people. Um, This is the the song of praise from Isaiah's suffering servant, but she reads it in Mosiah. Um, Of course, she could have read them in Isaiah, but she was reading the new book. When I read these words, my whole soul filled with joy and hope in the great mercy and goodness of God and the redemption of the human family. I began immediately to sing in tongues and sang several verses. This was the first time I had that gift, so I truly rejoiced in the Spirit and praised the Lord. Despite Elizabeth's unsettled present through the practice of reading, she experienced charismatic joy and comfort in the eschatological promise of the Book of Mormon. 
This did not happen in an instant. It took time to incorporate Joseph Smith's new textual expansions into one's knowledge base and life. Yet as converts read, they developed an alliance with the text, as they had previously with the biblical narrative. Over time, echoes and allusions would mark that relationship. Um, there remains much to learn about the Book of Mormon in early Latter-day Saint practice. However, an ex initial examination of these personal writings helps us to consider Book of Mormon reception as a more complete whole. The writings of Latter-day Saint converts begin to illustrate the personal value of the book beyond that of a sign. Though early Latter-day Saints, like most Americans, were a people of the Bible, their attachment to the biblical text did not negate their acceptance of a new book. It reinforced it. Reading the book became a part of both community and individual devotional practice over time. <coughs> Excuse me. We need not assume that the book instantly became a central focus for all, practices individual, and transitions. Over time, no one mastered almost 600 pages instantaneously. For those whose personal practice included the book, the text played a significant narrative function through which many early Latter-day Saints began to order and understand their lives in their own holy present. The text offered them patterns of divine intervention that could apply in their own lives and exemplars to emulate. The book had the power to do the same for their familiars if they too would develop a relationship with the book. Accepting the book as scripture gave the text power to narrate their lives. Book of Mormon language and characters began to enter their lives and sacralize their present, um, choosing to live lives as Latter-day Saints. They were a people of the book who became a people of the books. No single book was now entirely sufficient. Thank you. If anyone needs to take off, no worries. I understand. But if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer a few, too. Yeah, because we're over time, maybe we'll pause for 60 seconds for anyone who wants to um, escape. And then we'll, if that's okay, Janice will take a few. Okay, I think we've got Chris. What is the Book of Mormon? You know, we have these Moroni sections about ritual performances, baptism. Do we see that those are used as a formula in early, early church? That's true. Yeah, very definitely. Um, so some of the people, um, so Ryan Tobler has written quite a bit on baptism, particularly. Um, I kind of just talked about those in general, but there are a number of people who have written about um, Mike McKay, D Garrett Dirkmat, um, Scott Farling initially did some, some work. Um, the Book of Mormon was really used to write. I mean, Oliver is using the Book of Mormon. Section, I think it's section 16 says that, um, that he should rely on that which is written. And he's very clearly using the Book of Mormon text to write the original draft of the Articles and Covenants. Um, they, they use the Book of Mormon for prayers. They use it for the order of baptism. They use it for, for ritual. Um, there's a recent book by Gerald Smith where he argues that um, Joseph's temple theology actually comes out of the Book of Mormon. Emily. These are much prettier. <laughs> They're much, much prettier, right? <laughs> and it's, I mean, it's obvious that people could get, like, very ornately expensive, you know, personal copies of the Book of Mormon even then. Um, but when we talk about, was her name Phelps, like, leaving a Book of Mormon with a family? Yeah. Would she have had, like, a quote-unquote missionary Book of Mormon, or was that probably her own copy, maybe her only copy? So it was, it could have been hers. It also could have been her husband's because the family takes her to the jail the day after they break out and she's able to gather her husband's stuff. So it's possible it could be her husband's, but it's probably someone's personal book. 
Um, and there are different bindings early on. There are nice, like these, actually the British bindings are way better than the American bindings, um, as with m many things. Um, but um, the, the American bindings, you have lots of different levels. Um, or I showed a couple books that had people's names stamped on the front. The one on the right said P. Cowdery. We think that's Patience Cowdery. It's an 1837 book. Um, that's the nicest bound 1837 second edition that I've ever seen. It's, it's gorgeous. Um, and it's in very nice leather. But there are lots of different levels. Um, they also don't, like with the original 5,000 books in the first edition, they don't bind all of them immediately. Some of them are bound later. So, so there are different options. But they all cost. Um, and for those of us of a certain age who are used to giving away books of Mormon on our mission, that is a really relatively new in invention. Um, in the mid-80s, you're still, people are buying books. Sometimes wards will buy a box of books for a missionary because the missionary has to buy those books to give out themselves. Dave. So, um, so this summer, I went on a few trips. Um, I spent some time in the Northeast and in California. Um, and then I also went to England and Scotland, um, trying to make this not American-centric. But I am looking at the physical, the material record of the books and what that tells us about um, how they were used. Now, there, of course, are limitations of this. The books that were used the most are not lasting, you know, are not still around. But I have seen about 450 books so far. Um, so I've been looking from 1831st, from the first edition to 1920. Um, I'm not sure if my larger project will go that far, but that's, that's the first time that we have um, verses it's the first time we have kind of expanded headings and expanded footnotes. It's kind of the, the first step towards what, we, what we're used to today. Um, and so, and I've seen about um, maybe 55 first editions. So I know that there are other people, Royal Scouts and seen like 100 um, first editions. Um, but I'm trying to look at what the material record tells us about how they're using the books. Um, as I think I mentioned before, but as the 19th century moves along, people begin to write increasingly more in their books. But a lot of the marginalia is just kind of keeping track of the narrative. You know, this is a complex narrative. Many of my, you know, first semester Book of Mormon students are clueless about the narrative of the Book of Mormon. It's, it's complex, and they're just trying to, to, keep, it, um, to keep it straight. Um, and, and I think that that's part of this, this argument that they weren't using the book because perhaps they're not pulling um, Protestant theology, you know, systematic Protestant theology from the book, but that doesn't mean they're not using the text. They're, the, the narrative, they're applying that, that narrative um, like Nephi tells them to, but they were already doing it. Thank you. Sure. Question. So um, that's something that I haven't yet addressed. So um, Joseph Smith, I mean, part of this, this kind of earlier assessment is that Joseph's not, um, in the words of Joseph Smith, I think we have Joseph quoting from the Book of Mormon three times, um, I think all from Alma. Um, the Joseph Smith papers have given us uh, some new additions to that, um, to, to, to add to that. Um, but um, you get... Um, I want to find a way to quantitatively assess that. Um, people have done work with citations, but unfortunately, citations are easier to find, but um, don't reflect everything. Um, in Parley Pratt's A Voice of Warning, he cites the Book of Mormon three times just towards the end, 
and this is a missionary tract. I mean, it was in in public. It was being published until at least the 1960s, um, and it's all about the Bible leading people to the Book of Mormon from the Bible. But the second paragraph of it, he says that this would be for a prophet and learning. He's quoting Nephi. He's you know he's the Book of Mormon is shaping the argument that he's making, even though he's not citing it, and so that takes more work to identify all of those locations. And I'm trying to figure out a way with, um, with the Journal of Discourses and some of those published things that, that ha we have easy accessibility to do some sort of qualitative analysis. So I'm going to work on that. So I'm not sure that I can say that yet, but we are kind of tracking um, as as I go through as we go through sources. I have this lovely um, army. Someone called them an army. <laughs> Three of you who are here, I don't think make up an army, but um, I have some fantastic research assistants, and um, we're working on kind of identifying their origin, where the person is from. So we, because I would like to be able to tell if someone from upstate New York receives it differently than someone from Wales. And um, so I don't have enough kind of points on that map to kind of yield that yet, but that's something that, that we want to, I'm, I'm hoping to, to get to, to be able to find. Very good. Could you, yeah. Um, well, I, I just, there is change over time. <laughs> How's that? Um, I think that, that that is one of the, the difficult things here um, because we certainly have change over time. Um, in 1984, when President Benson gives uh, his talk at the Mexico City Temple dedication, A New Witness for the Book of Mormon, um, he quotes section 84, verse 57, which talks about that you know, we're under condemnation. Now, Joseph, for not using the Book of Mormon and all the former commandments um, enough to treating them lightly. Um, Joseph received that revelation in 1832. Um, I, as I read that revelation, it says the Book of Mormon and all the former commandments. And I think all of us treat scripture lightly at some point or another. Um, but since President um, Benson, we have certainly had a swing towards the Book of Mormon. Um, there is, and there are those kinds of swings throughout this, this history. Um, in the 1880s and early 1890s, there is kind of a flurry of different commentaries and different books being written about the Book of Mormon. Um, I, whether that's coming from people ignoring the Book of Mormon for a little while, I'm not quite sure yet. Um, but we do have these changes, and this emphasis certainly ebbs and, and flows. And it's also ch it, very individual. Um, we have a few people who are very similar to Lucy Mack Smith and are speaking scripture all the time. Um, today I was actually thinking about the first time I saw like a Joseph Smith movie. It was maybe, I don't know if it was legacy or what it was, but I was like, really? Did he just spout scripture all the time? Is that how he spoke? And, and there are people like Lucy Mack Smith who spout scripture all the time. That is just how, that, how they express themselves. But there are other people, Caroline Barnes Crosby would not quote a scripture to save her life, but she quotes Shakespeare all over the place. So, um, so different people do different things. Brigham Young is not going to have the kind of intertextuality that Lucy Mack has, but he has a few poignant moments that kind of demonstrate how he's using the text. And so I think that we have a lot of changes from individuals, but also change over time. And I'm hoping to be able to map out some of those changes a little more clearly as the project progresses. Well, thank you all for coming and sticking it out. We're a little later than we anticipated, but I appreciate it. Thank you.